All right. Talking about elders today, we have still this assignment um, from the men here to begin to teach about what it takes to appoint elders in the local church. And the goal of this is that we will uh, look for nominations at the end of this and uh, maybe at the end of this month or into next month. I'm not 100% sure exactly the time frame, but we'll look for nominations. Uh, before that time, we will have a lesson on questions and answers, just questions that have come up and have been brought to uh, my attention. I'll, I'll put them into a lesson to address those things. And if you have uh, questions that uh, you haven't brought up to me, let me know so I'll have time to put them in and answer them. <laughs> um, all right, so that's method. We began in this series about appointing elders, talking about the elder material just to show that everybody should be elder material. There's all the things that they're being asked to do and to be are things that every Christian is asked to do and to be, with some obvious exceptions. You're not required to become a married person. You're not required to become a, a parent. Um, and there's nothing you can do about being a new convert when you were baptized last week. <laughs> um, those, I think, are fairly obvious exceptions. But with that, with those kind of caveats in mind, pretty much what they're being called to is a right living, Christian living. And if you are married, you have to be monogamous the way that that one, the elder, is required to be. If you are a parent, you have to correct your children the way that the elder is required to be. There's not something there that is loosed, uh, you know, except for the fact that you're trying to be an elder. So that was our first point, and I think is I hope is a point of hope and encouragement because it means well we do kind of know what this means. These are not really tricks; they're not meant to trip us up. They're just a way of describing what they need to be, how they need to be, and that you're looking for somebody faithful to put into place. Now we get to something that's a little more. Uh, stringent, and I think that it wor is worth treating differently. Um, this person, this shepherd or elder, has a requirement in in Titus. And now I'm worried that I didn't put those slides in here. I think I did. Oh, I did. Okay, right. They have a requirement to do these things that are, in fact, a little bit harder. And so they are worthy of focus. And that's what we'll do here. And I think this is probably two lessons. First of all, let's get the verse. It's one verse, Titus 1.9. Uh, because Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 are basically parallel when it comes to requirements for elders. 9 and following in Titus is where you start to see a little bit more here explicitly spelled out as the duties of elders, although it's in 1 Timothy, you have to go find those verses and realize that they go together with the elders because of the way that Titus clearly puts them together. So I'm going to let Titus drive from here. Verse 9 is, the elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. That's uh, the English Standard Version. Um, I think a lot of them are worse. And uh, here is the LZV. If you're not familiar with the LZV, that's the uh, Luis Zamora version. <laughs> uh, he must hold firm to the word of faith that accords with the teaching, so that he may be able both to encourage by means of his own healthful teaching, and also to cross-examine those who contradict it. So I want to get across the structure of this, which is that he has to hold firm to the word. The purpose of holding firm to that word is that it makes him able 
he has to be able um, to, to accomplish this work. And that's where I say this might be more than just what is necessarily considered the duty of every Christian. Okay, this is something that calls for maturity in life. He has to hold firm the word. This makes him able to do two different duties, both of which are required. And in fact, the original language puts an emphatic both and, uh, both to instruct and also to rebuke. These are in parallel that that is the, the, the duty here. The word allows him to give instructions and the word allows him to give rebukes too. On the one hand, the instruction that he gives or the teaching that he himself does is instruction in sound doctrine, which we'll get to. On the other hand, the rebuke that he does also from a stance of holding firm, firm to the word, the rebuke is for people who contradict the sound doctrine the sound teaching of the Lord. Um, okay, so we're going to start in this looking at what it means um, as we, as we um, saw just a bit earlier. He must hold firm the trustworthy word as taught. So that's the first thing we're going to look at here. Take hold firm, hold firm. In the dictionary, the Greek dictionary for this word that occurs in Titus 1, the definition is to hold on nearby, you know, cling to. In the dictionary, they gave an example where this was used with reference to the Greek god Hercules, saying cling to Hercules. And their, um, their translation of that would be worship Hercules above all. So when they gave that definition and when they gave an example translation, their meaning of hold firm is that thing above all things. You're dedicated to that thing. You're devoted to that thing. And it does come from the literal um, words, the literal root. I mean, it's the same word, but the way it's being used here is a special thing talking about our devotion. Generally, that word means withstand, hold out against odds or against bad things happening, right? Endure, stand your ground. That's usually what the word means. In this case, it's actually saying we hold out again, or we withstand or we endure in the sense that we are standing with the word as taught. Okay, so that's the meaning of this in terms of a definition. Where does it occur? Well, there are places, but I think Matthew 6 is probably the most useful such place where Jesus said, no one can serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one, that's our word, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus said that this is what it means when we speak of hold firm to a master. We mean he's devoted to the one master. You can't have two. Um, and this is just a plain truth about life. You can't have two priorities. There's one thing that is most important, and that's the thing that you are doing. <laughs> you're either doing what this master asked you to do, which is the most important thing, or you're doing what that master asked you to do, which is the most important thing. You can't do both at the same time. That's a simple matter. And his point is that devotion, which master do you serve? Which one do you hold to? Which one um, has a command or a will or a priority that is the thing that you actually do? That's the one that really has control. So holding, fir uh, holding firm to the word then is his devotion to God's word. He doesn't have another master. When we speak of the trustworthy word, 
an English Standard Version. This word for trustworthy is actually the word that is usually rendered faithful in the New Testament, which helps us very easily place it together with Romans 10, 17. Faith comes through hearing, and hearing comes through the word of Christ, the word of God. The word is what generates faith. The word is the seed of the sower that is sown and generates plants, generates Christians, right? So the trustworthy word is the word of the faith. The word of God is the implication, right? This word, not just any word that's a trustworthy saying, but the word of faith, the word of God. The next phrase there in Titus 1.9 is as taught, at least in the English Standard Version. But literally, it says, according to the teaching. And I will introduce something here. I ask you to uh, hang with me for a bit. This is odd, I realize, and I hope not too strange or too hard to follow. But the fact is, in recent studies, I have determined that the New Testament does draw a distinction between something that I've decided to call the teaching and just the act of doing some teaching. <laughs> there's the teaching, as in the doctrine of God, and then there's teaching, which people do. Um, but I see in that more than just semantics. They're actually different words. The word for the teaching, it comes from the, the root of to teach, whereas somebody's teaching comes from the root of a teacher. <laughs> so they, in their office of being a teacher, are doing this thing on a regular day. It's, it's what they do. It's their action of doing teaching, not the same as the doctrine itself the teaching itself, which would correspond to, say, in, in uh, the Old Testament, the Torah, the law of God, the teaching of God. So you, here's an example that I brought for John 7 and uh, 2 Timothy 3. You put these together. Th there's two different words for teaching here. Uh, in John 7, Jesus said, My teaching is not mine, it's his who sent me. You know what that means. It's the doctrine of God, the Father, that he is espousing. John seven sixteen, In 2 Timothy 3, verse 10, Paul says to Timothy, You, Timothy, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, etc. There's a long list of things. And it's true. Timothy was there. He saw how Paul acted and how he behaved and how he taught. But you can see a big difference, I think, between Jesus saying, my teaching isn't mine, it's the, the God who sent me. And Paul saying, Timothy, you followed my teaching. And he's not talking about as though he took the gospel and repackaged it, and you're buying Paul brand gospel. <laughs> That's not it. He's talking about, you saw how I did teaching when I was teaching. You know, the way that I taught, not the doctrine that I held. Although he did hold the doctrine. But what we're getting at is, there's a difference between the teaching of God and just somebody's teaching that they are doing, whether it is good or whether it is bad. And we should make this distinction. Oops. Because what's happening, actually, is in, in the verse itself, where it says he must hold firm the trustworthy word as taught, that he might be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine. These are actually, where it says as taught, that's a word teaching, and where it says sound doctrine, doctrine is the word teaching. But it's two different words. The first one is the one you see in John. It's the teaching of God. The second one is 
the teaching that he's supposed to be doing. So he, in the first place, is holding firm, oh, that's better, to the word of faith that accords with the teaching. That's an objective standard. That's what that is. His devotion, if you will. Remember that definition about cling to Hercules above all else. Right? That devotion, as Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. He's devoted to one. Is to what we would call an objective standard of God's word. The thing that doesn't move is God's word. The doctrine of God is his absolute devotion. And I will run down a list of other examples for you. Acts 2.42 is one. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That is the doctrine of God. And we also are devoted to the teaching of the apostles. That doesn't mean they sat around at the feet of the apostles while they were teaching, necessarily, although they may have. It's talking about the doctrine that the, apost that the apostles held and espoused and shared with the world, which is the New Testament, as you and I know it. <laughs> and we are also devoted to it, just like Acts 2.42, the church did. Romans 6.17 says, thanks be to God that you who once were slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to that standard of the teaching to which you were committed. Right. All of us who obeyed the gospel obeyed the gospel of Jesus. That's an outside, you know, third party objective standard. It's the word, the doctrine, the teaching. Romans 16, verse 17 says, I appeal to you, brothers, watch out or mark those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the teaching. Avoid them. That's contrary to the doctrine of God. And 2 John 9 through 11, you know well, but... We'll grab 9 and 10 here. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide inside the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching, that is, whoever stays within the boundaries of the teaching, has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. So you see, the doctrine itself, the teaching, the word of God is the objective standard that we hold to. The elder is required to have this as his devotion. That's his primary devotion. Which means, of course, he doesn't take sides. <laughs> He's no respecter of persons. Whoever comes and uh, talks with him or whatever problem comes to his attention that he can help us with, he's not in it. For you, he's in it for God, which of course is to your benefit, because God wants what is good for you, that you might be saved in the last day. You may not like it sometimes, I may not like it, if I'm in the wrong and somebody tells me I'm in the wrong, I don't like it, but it is what I need, because what I really don't want to find out is I don't want to get to the judgment day and determine that I actually failed to accomplish God's will. That is too late. Tell me now so I can repent, so I can obtain forgiveness, so I can still go to heaven if God is merciful and allows it. But the elder is to hold fast to an objective standard, which is God's word. That's his devotion. Not, if you will, this church, for that matter, not uh, you know, this place or this family, this name, this people, this culture, this anything, it's the word. That's what he's devoted to. That's the elder's job. Has to be. So that's the first thing. What does this make him able to do? Well, the first thing that we talk about this morning, and I think we'll run out of time, um, Let's get started on this. The first thing that his devotion to that word makes him able to do 
is it makes him able to give instruction in sound doctrine. All right, so let's talk about this. First, what is sound? <laughs> sound doctrine. What is sound? Sound is a word that means healthy. It's healthy. Um, our word hygiene is actually the exact same word as this Greek word. <laughs> um, and what is hygiene? Well, that's the, the regular um, care, the self-care of, you know, the, the bathing, the brushing, the, all the things you do to take care of your own health, washing your hands. That's hygiene. Because these are things that are the best things you can do that promote your health, right? Your safety from germs and other things, right? It's your health. All right, this is the meaning of the word in its simplest form. And that's why John said in 3 John, in the second verse, Beloved, I pray all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health, just as it goes well with your soul. So the person to whom John writes in 3 John is blessed in the soul. John knows this person is faithful. And things are going well with you in your soul. That's good. John also prays, therefore, that just as it goes well with the soul, it may go well with them in life. And that they may be in good health. So it is not wrong to pray for health. Um, if you are ill, certainly pray to God that you might recover. If you are suffering or have pain, Certainly pray to God that you may recover and use that strength to accomplish his will. You also have James 5 telling us that we can call for the elders, that they might come and, and lay hands and, and oil and pray for any who are sick. Um, you know, I, uh, it's not in this set of charts and maybe we should talk about it, but James 5 is sometimes taken in a miraculous context that somehow we're talking about the Holy Spirit and that the elders come and lay hands like a Holy Spirit miracle healing. Um, and that's just not necessary. That's not a necessary conclusion of what it says there. What that looks like to me is Vicks VapoRub. Uh, Vicks VapoRub, right? I don't work for Vicks. I'm not getting any cut here, all right? But just... That's oil, you know? <laughs> uh, I know it's not. It's super advanced medical technology. Yeah, it's oil, um, and you're putting it on somebody who is sick, right? Mom rubs this on baby's chest, you know, or, or you do this yourself if you're at home and you got the sniffles maybe on somewhere, right? This is oil. It takes hands when you are sick. One of the best things for you is a loved one laying hands on you. And if that means applying a medicine, whatever, Bengay Asper Cream, uh, Tiger Balm, all those kinds of things, these are all oils. That's anointing. <laughs> and they're laying hands on you to help you feel better and get better. So I don't think it has to be a miraculous thing there in James 5. And whether it is or it isn't is irrelevant to us who can work no miracles and beside the point. The point is, it's all right for you to have health and to ask for health in prayer, okay? That being said, Jesus takes that same concept, which clearly does mean health, and applies it to spiritual things. And that's the meaning for the elder, clearly. How can teaching be healthy? Can it be sick? No, it can neither be healthy nor sick but it can be the kind of thing that makes you healthy or makes you sick. It's healthful or sickening, right? Sound is healthy or healthful, really. And Jesus applies it to a spiritual thing when he says in Luke 5.31, those who are well have no need of a physician. Those who are sick need the physician. It's an example of a physical truth 
But he's talking about the fact that these people need repentance, and he's teaching them spiritual things while he's among them. The reason he is eating with sinners and tax collectors is because they are spiritually sick, and he is giving them spiritual teaching that makes for health. They need to be brought back to health, and the way to do that is healthful teaching, sound doctrine. That's the meaning of this. The sound doctrine is a teach is teaching. Doctrine is teaching. And it's healthful teaching, a teaching that makes for good health. Healthful teaching. And I you know, again, I know that on these kinds of things I do sound very pedantic. Um and I am, you know, I confess to being an errant pedant, right? <laughs> That's, it's true. I'm one of those people that gets mad when people say hate is a noun. It is not. Hatred is a noun. <laughs> yes, I am a pedant, okay? Fair enough. But the point that I'm making here is that the teaching makes you healthy or the teaching makes you sick. That's what I mean when I say it's healthful. It's for your health. It's intended to bring you to health. Sound doctrine is healthy teaching, the kind of teaching you do when you want good spiritual health, right? This is the meaning of it. It brings about that right outcome. And so, you know, again, it's useful, I think, too. We alluded earlier to um, sports. Um, and there are a lot of good illustrations from sports in the New Testament. And this is one of them. A person who is an athlete is going to control their diet and control their activities and control their sleep schedule because these are all, you know, dials you can turn to try and affect how you're going to feel and how you're going to perform. And they're doing that, you know, they compete for a temporary crown. But we, of course, are running the race of faith for an eternal crown, an eternal weight of glory. Okay, so our doctrine then should be the kind that makes for spiritual health. Spiritual health is the idea when it says that he gives, he's able to give instruction in sound doctrine, meaning because of his devotion to the word as the absolute standard, he therefore knows how to give you something that leads to good spiritual health, the absolute standard of God's word. There's also, in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, this pattern of sound words, which is used very often as a well-beloved theme and worth beloving, I guess. But it actually starts in 1 Timothy, which is not terribly obvious, but we're going to point that out. Paul first brought this idea up when he said to Timothy, I formerly was a blasphemer, but... 1 Timothy 1.16, I received mercy for this reason, so that in me as the foremost, that is the chief of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. This as an example is the same as a pattern. It is the pattern in the pattern of sound words in 2 Timothy that we're about to read. But he's saying, though he himself was an insolent blasphemer and did many terrible things to Christians, he still was able to receive mercy. And this is the sign or the indication from the Lord that you can be forgiven. It is an example, it is a pattern for everybody who would believe in him for eternal life. You have to understand that no matter how far gone you think you are, how bad off you are, God can still forgive you. You can still be brought back if you will repent. That is the pattern of sound words. So when you find in 2 Timothy, at the end of his life, when he writes Timothy, he says to him, picking up 2 Timothy 1 at verse 12, I'm not ashamed because I know whom I believed 
I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the healthful words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. You are aware all who are in Asia have turned away from me. You see where, what he's getting at? You start to think about this, you can see what he's getting at. He was the foremost of sinners, and yet he was able to repent and obtain forgiveness. And indeed, he was appointed an apostle. That's an example, that's a pattern for those who would believe. Now he suffered many things at the hands of evildoers and false teachers in the church as well. But for all of that, he said, I'm not ashamed. Not ashamed, because I know whom I've believed. I'm convinced that he is able to guard to the day, to that day what has been entrusted to me. I mean, God's promise to you of salvation will not be broken. And God's entrusting his word to you will not be prove empty or useless, futile. And he says, Timothy, you follow this pattern of sound words, healthful words. It's that, that pattern is the word example in 1 Timothy 1.16. You follow that. It's faith and love in Christ, really. Guard that deposit that's entrusted to you. He said, I'm not ashamed. I know the God whom I believed I know that he will keep that which has that deposit until the last day. You, Timothy, you guard the deposit given to you. Why? Because you're the last man standing. That's what this is. Timothy, you are the last man standing. You are well aware that everybody else around you has turned away. That's what happened. And that is what 2 Timothy 4 says. That, um, you know, that, that's, what, that's what he um, tells Timothy, which, again, Timothy's already aware of, how that Demas had forsaken him and gone on to Thessalonica, Titus to um, Dalmatia, I guess Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Those are in parallel. I've sometimes heard people say, well, it says Demas forsook him. The other two, he's just telling them where they are. No, no, they're in parallel. There's actually only one verb there. They all three did this. They all three deserted him. They all three left him for different places, which Timothy already knows. He is well aware. Why does that matter with regard to a pattern of sound words? Well, it matters because they had a word that would have made for spiritual health, but they didn't hold on to it and they fell and they've deserted God. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed. I know that God can deliver. And again, you put it with the fourth chapter where he says, henceforth is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord himself will give me. He knows. But Timothy, do you know? <laughs> Timothy, you guard that in, that uh, you guard that good deposit entrusted to you. And doesn't that mean you and me? I mean, it does, right? That means you and me. We have been given a good deposit, which is the sound words of God. We must guard that too and not forsake him. Yeah, let me grab this and we'll close out. There's another place for definition purposes of sound, which is 1 Timothy 1, I would draw your attention to. 
because it gives you a list of the things that are contrary to sound teaching. So the phrase sound doctrine occurs there in the 10th verse. Here is the list of things that are contrary to it, the opposite of it, maybe help us to define it. The law is laid down not for the just. The law is laid down for the lawless and disobedient, the ungodly and sinners, the unholy and profane, those who hit their fathers and mothers, those who are murderers, those who are sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers or slave traders, liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. So you, can, you get an idea when you look at the list of things. All of these are the opposite of sound teaching. We don't embrace any of these things, whether that be lawlessness, disobedience, ungodliness, and sin, unholiness, and profanity, striking fathers and mothers, murderish, sex, sexual immorality, homosexuality, slave trading, lying, perjury. We don't go with any of that. Our teaching does not accord with any of these things. That's contrary to sound teaching. None of that is going to lead to spiritual health. I'm going to leave it right there and come back to this at the next opportunity. We have a little bit more to talk about on the instruction side of things, and then we'll also talk about get started talking about rebuke. I don't know if we're going to finish it all, <laughs> but we'll try. But the job of that elder, the job of that shepherd, includes an absolute devotion to God's word as the objective standard to which we must all be held. That's the basis of the teaching he does that promotes spiritual health. He is able to give us instructions to say what should be done. That's the lesson today. And in the next lesson, we'll begin talking about how that same standard of the faith is the means by which he can rebuke people who contradict it. We'll look at that rebuke, the uh, cross-examination, however you want to describe it, um, when we get opportunity. But I hope that the big picture here is fairly clear, that there is a maturity in this. He has to have enough stability in the word that he knows how to give instructions. He knows how to give advice about what should be done that will turn into the right and the good what is going to glorify God in your life and in my life and in the actions of the church. I thank you for your kind attention. The question comes to you then, have you devoted your life to God? Have you accepted the absolute standard of God's word? in your life for your purpose. You know whether you've done this because you know whether you have become a Christian or not. What does it take to be the Christian? Well, believe in God, repent of sin. Say, you know, in your own heart, in your heart of hearts, I've been wrong and God is right. I'll submit myself to his will, which begins with being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness where you, you are uh, washed, not by the power of the water, but by the power of the blood of Jesus that forgives sins and washes away every sin and makes you whole again. From that point forward, you live as a Christian. You have an advocate with the Father, Jesus. When you go to him in prayer, your prayers now are very effective. Oh, he heard you before, but... It's only so effective. Now you have an advocate with the Father when you're a Christian. Now you can overcome sin. As a Christian, if you haven't lived right, repent, pray for forgiveness. Let us pray with you too, because we need encouragement. If we can help you in the Spirit with our prayers, or we can help you in the Spirit to be baptized, 
Please let your need be known at this time by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs> 